Let's talk about the four A's, um, where it's been and uh, where it is today. Well, the four A's is almost 100 years old. Mm -hmm. We'll celebrate our 100th anniversary in 2016, or 2017. Um, and, you know, I think up until recently, very typical trade association. So we were there to represent our members, not only to the industry, but in Washington and in other issues, and then to provide services and benefits for those members uh, where we could. I think what we've tried to do in the last five years is to evolve from a trade association mentality mm -hmm. and more of a community organizer, if you will. Still representing the industry where we need to, mm -hmm. but also getting better, I think, at bringing people together around issues. Um, so get, I always say we're at our best when we get the right people in the right room at the right time to talk about the right things. Why did that need to happen? Um, I just think that the world of business has become much more uh, community sensitive, if you will, and people don't talk about wanting to belong to a trade association, but they want to belong to something that's bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. And recognizing that community is what social media is all about, um, just taking a different approach in the way that we were thinking about how we serve our members. Was that mirroring what was happening in the industry itself, or do you feel like the industry had moved on and gotten there already into that place and the, and the association had lagged? Well, I, I think the association had lagged and I think the industry had gotten to that place and I think it was incumbent on me and the, the staff that um, I work with and our team to make sure that we were keeping up with our agencies because I, I really don't think we were. Yeah. Um, I don't want to uh, denigrate anything that went on before I got there, mm -hmm. but I just think it was time to take a look at the organization with fresh eyes. So as you look at it now and you have been there for five years, um, what would you identify as your biggest, biggest accomplishments? What are you most proud of? Um, I'm most proud of the fact that um, for the last two years, we've been gaining more members than losing. Mm -hmm. um, and for several years prior, the thing was going in a different direction. I'm also proud of all the work that we've done collaboratively with the IAB and the ANA, um, most notably on the whole privacy initiative and what we were able to do to build the Digital Advertising Alliance, mm -hmm. um, which now is serving something like uh, 1.3 trillion impressions up on a weekly basis for that little icon. So it's already, it's funny, it's already got 34% awareness and it's only been around for a year. So for that kind of phenomena to happen. What do you attribute that to? I just, I just think that, you know, the donated media that we got, mm -hmm. um, the work that went into developing that icon, everything's very straightforward. It talks about the fact that advertising is a good thing um, with regard to your um, interests. Mm -hmm. Um, rather than advertising being an evil thing, I think, and I think people genuinely care. But when they take the time to go read what this is all about, they opt at, they opt to stay in. Right. They opt to stay in, and that's a really valuable thing for the industry. Now, when you joined, um, you were the first woman to to assume the role. Um, let's talk about the the challenge of diversity in the industry. It's it's been a challenge for a while. It continues to be, but you've made some strides there, and you're certainly proud of some of the accomplishments in that area in particular. Yeah, I, um, you know, when I first took the job, all the reporters wanted to make the job about the fact that I was the first woman. And I had to really turn the reporters and, and get them to understand that, no, it's because I've worked in Baltimore, St. Louis, Los Angeles, San Francisco, all manner and sizes of agencies. And I've worked with technology clients and packaged goods clients, and nobody has my resume. That's why I got the job, not mm -hmm. because I'm a woman. It was, right. oh, by the way, I happen to be a woman. Mm -hmm. but. I think that the industry finally, I can actually now, five years in, finally say hand over heart, taking all of this very seriously. Um, and, and I would say it's more about the, the agencies understanding that inclusion is a good thing for business. Mm -hmm. Um, that they understand that the consumers that they're trying to talk to come from all different walks of life. And I think that the real eye-opening moment um, wasn't when Obama was elected the first time, but somewhere halfway through his first term when everybody realized what was really happening with the Hispanic community. And then it certainly bore itself out with what happened to the Republican Party during the last election. And when you have a part of the population that is be quickly becoming the majority, and that's not reflected in the, the agency world, you have a big problem. And I do think that people are recognizing that now. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think that some agencies are getting very good at trying to balance diversity better than they have. And there are still, sadly, some agencies who don't take it seriously. Sure. But it has to be a business imperative. And if okay. you don't make it a business imperative, it won't happen. Um, talent obviously is another big charge for you. Yep. Um, and, and I have had um, global CMOs say um, it's just not a destination career the way it once was, advertising and mm -hmm. marketing. Um, what do you say to that? It, it may not be a destination career. Um, I think we have an awareness problem with um, young people coming into the industry. Uh, there's many aspects to this whole talent issue, but let's just start with young people coming in. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we're on a lot of people's radar screens. Uh, there's certainly nothing out there in the zeitgeist to get us on their radar screens, and that's one of the things we're trying to address, mostly through social. Um, I also think we have a talent problem now that's very different once people get into an agency. You've got a generation who doesn't necessarily want a boss, who wants to be the boss immediately, who uh, doesn't necessarily want to go through everything that we went through, who communicate completely. And that could arguably say, be said of any industry. Absolutely, absolutely. But because we always were looking for the most creative minds right. in our industry, regardless of whether your title actually says the word creative, those are the kind of people who are going to be attracted to doing a startup. And when you, and I, there was an NBC poll, I think, last year that said that 54% of uh, recent college graduates intend to start their own business. Okay, you've just lost 46% of the population right there. Mm -hmm. Then you lose doctors, lawyers, and teachers, and we're talking about a really small pie. So it's not just getting them in, but once we get them in, allowing them to work the way they want to work. Which That's isn't, a big cultural shift. It is a big cultural shift. Yeah. You know, even at the 4As, we've tried to make sure that we can do that. So, for instance, um, we have a policy for people who need to work at home. Well, I, what I found is I don't have children, and so it would be very easy for me to go in the office five days a week. But if I don't work from home one day a week to prove to the rest of the staff that it's okay to do this, people won't do it. Mm -hmm. And that my point is that it, the behavior has to come from the CEO down. If sure. it doesn't, it, people won't understand that this is acceptable behavior. Let's talk also a little bit about the collaboration that you're doing with the client side marketers. Um, clearly that's also been important to you. Um, your um, upcoming conference, annual conference, has what, more, more CMO speaking than ever before? Than ever before. Okay, talk about why that's so important. Um, for the four A's, but for the industry in general? There are a lot of issues that are shared on both sides. Um, you've got everything from how a client goes about selecting a new agency when they're looking for a new agency, or if they should be looking for an agency. That's, that's an even bigger question. You've got compensation issues. There's every manner and model of compensation between mm -hmm. client and agency that's out there. You, we've got major issues in the industry uh, with patent uh, assertions. Um, it's happening more and more on a really regular basis and that's really got to be a shared problem. It can't be um, just falling on the agency to give the indemnification. So we've got to have this dialogue with clients. Mm -hmm. If we don't have this dialogue we end up not solving the problems or solving it or, or, or making the problem only one party's problem when it really is a shared problem. Sure. And we're better together than we are trying to do this separately. How would you characterize the agency-client relationship as it is today, and where is it going? Um, I think, for the most part, between uh, CMOs and agencies, the, the relationship is pretty solid, um, and that they understand all the craziness that's happened with the fragmentation of media and that they really, the clients understand that they need the agencies to help guide them mm -hmm. because they just simply don't have the resources on staff to do this themselves. Um, where I think we still have a lot of pain points is between the agencies and procurement who continue to wreak havoc in terms of squeezing agencies to mm -hmm. a point where they really can't service clients. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the message we have to get across, is that if you want the truly best people, the agencies need to be able to pay those people. Otherwise, you're going to get mediocre people and you're going to get mediocre work. Mm -hmm. And if we don't find a way to make sure that agencies are getting paid fairly, then it's just going to continue to affect the kind of work you get as a CMO. Sure. And, and that's where I think procurement's a little bit out of the loop in terms of how they look at agency compensation. Um, because Hopefully as more procurement officers come with marketing backgrounds that might 
alleviate the issue I, a little I'm bit. hopeful. I'm hopeful on that front. But, you know, frankly, they're getting paid to reduce the cost. And anytime that's your incentive, it's what you're going to be laser focused right. on. Right. So where do you go from here? We're going to continue. I think that uh, if I had come into this job thinking that, okay, the goal is over here, the goal went over in this direction very quickly because of what happened in 08 and 09. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think we're going to continue to modernize. We're going to continue to stay in front of agency issues as much as we possibly can. For instance, we've done three years worth of work on all this patent stuff and we're attacking it from a number of fronts. And I think it's the, the kind of challenge that's going to continue for the agencies and we want to be there fighting the good fight. That's what we do.